Heavenly Father, so excited and grateful to be back in the house to study your word, to grow with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we want to give this time to you. Lord, I'm especially excited because of our study now through the book of Philippians, a book that in my personal study time has been enriching to my spirit, uh, maturing to my heart. Lord, I pray that as we open up the word of the Lord tonight, Father, that you will open up our eyes to behold wondrous things in your law, and that you will open up our minds that we will understand the scriptures. Let your Holy Spirit burn within us as you lead us along the road. Lord, I pray that what we know not will you teach us. What we have not will you give us, and who we are not will you make us. Lord, I pray that you'll just allow your spirit to settle in this place and to be our teacher. Hide me behind you so that your word may be proclaimed in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, as I said tonight, we're going to be picking back off where we left off. And I say that because our founder, Pastor Stephen Armstrong, close to three years ago had started this particular book. And he left off at verse 5. In fact, he gave in his introductory teaching, if you will, on the book of Philippians, he walked us through what it meant and the joy that we would have together as a group to see how we'll grow in the study of this particular book. And we understood that for many who listened to Pastor Steve during that time, uh, for many years, it was a huge loss to the entire ministry, to the world who had listened to him for over 20 years. And so we felt that it was best to kind of put Philippians off on the side, allow people to grieve and to mourn, and then to come back into the book. And as we started seeking the Holy Spirit to know, hey, Lord, where do you want us to go next? What's the next book? Um, It it was a no-brainer that Philippians would be that next book. And so now after three years, we're going to do that tonight. And so we're going to pick up where we left off. If you've followed Steve's first teaching in this book, it was verses one through five. And that book or that teaching, rather, he entitled it, Why Are You Still Here? Why Are You Still Here? And it was in this teaching, Why Are You Still Here? It's available on the VBVMI website. You can go to the single teaching area where you're going to see all of Steve's teaching. That's not going anywhere. It's remaining forever and ever. Amen. So continue to check out those teachings. What I want to do tonight is I want to pick us up at verse 5 because we're going to continue on there. And what I want to do is end off with the slide that Steve ended with, which is going to be this one here with the chapter breakdown. I, I like to start things out with an outline and know how we're gonna flow through the book. And so what we're going to see in this chapter breakdown is in chapter one, we're going to see our purpose is to live for Christ. Our purpose is to live for Christ. Chapter two, we're going to see what the goal is. The goal is to think like Christ. Chapter three is gonna be our reward is to come from Christ. And chapter four, our satisfaction is to serve Christ. And I think you're going to see a conglomerate of all of this in the chapter, in the verses rather, that we're going to go over tonight. Furthermore, I want to begin our time with the fundamental question that Steve left us with. That fundamental question was, why are you not dead yet? Why are you still here? Why is there still breath in your lungs? More importantly, what are you to be actively doing for Christ with the life that he's given you? Are you just sitting on the bench or are you going to be actively in the game? Okay, and it's my prayer that as we walk through this book, we're going to be able to answer that first question. Why are you not dead yet? We'll be able to answer that by the end of our time through Philippians. If I were to put a tag on our text tonight, it would simply be this, partakers of his grace, partakers of his grace. And if I were to put an asterisk next to that, I would say gospel impact, gospel impact. So with that being said, what I want to do is do a quick overview from the first teaching, the introduction, and we're going to look at verses three through five, and then we're going to continue in our teaching tonight, verses five onward. So again, pick me up chapter 1, verses 3 through 5 for the reading of the word of the Lord. This is what the Apostle Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. 
He says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now, from the first day until now. So again, as we have reread the opening lines with the exception of verses one through two, which were in the introduction, it's really hard if you think about it to imagine that we find the Apostle Paul writing this love letter, this letter of great affection in such difficult circumstances. Friends, he's writing this letter of love and thanksgiving while suffering for the sake of Christ and the advancement of the gospel. And all the while, in his present condition, check this out, Paul is thanking God for his remembrance of this particular church. And again, I want you to notice something, that throughout the duration of Paul's letter, you're going to see splattered here and there, Paul using the word all. He's going to use the word all quite a bit. And the reason why I bring that up is because it's important to note that Paul isn't speaking just to individuals in the body that he likes. Paul's not just speaking to those in whom are his favorite within this particular church. Rather, Paul is speaking to every believer in this body, even those believers who he's at odds with in addressing this letter. And you might ask, well, Wes, what are you talking about? Who's he at odds with in this letter? Well, we're going to find later on that in Philippians chapter 4, verse 2, there's issue within the church with Eodia and Sithki. There's this unity, this discord that's been broken between these two individuals. And so Paul's going to address them at the end. Remember, Paul's remembrance, his thankfulness and prayers of joy for this church come about because of his closeness of heart with this church. If you were to think about it this way, it's like a father with his children or a mother with her child, seeing them growing up over time, maturing. You start off with the baby crawling and now they're walking, getting a job and doing their thing. Paul is looking over this church as a mother hen or a father hen would do so. Again, know know this, that it would not have been about close to 10 years prior to this letter being written, that Paul witnessed the growth, the gospel growth within this church. So we see that even in the midst of Paul's great distress, being confined to this particular prison in Rome, that Paul is still experiencing joy in the midst of his suffering. And the way that Paul is experiencing this joy is not circumstantially, right? It's not the circumstance that has Paul excited. Rather, it's experiential. That there is this experiential joy that Paul is experiencing through Christ, sharing in the grace that God has given both he and this church. This experiential joy is fully known because positionally, both Paul and these believers are preserved and are kept in the Lord Jesus. As we'll see in the teaching of Philippians, true joy is not defined by the present circumstances. True joy is not found in the sense of what you're going through. Rather, it's found in Christ as you're going through what you're going through. And it's in verse 5 that we see the answer to Paul's overwhelming sense of joy regarding the Philippian church. Check this out. Paul mentions that it's because of their participation in the gospel from the first day until now. That's huge. I would underline that or highlight that. He's he's excited for their participation in the gospel from the first day until now. That word participation in Greek is koinonia. Koinonia. And it simply means fellowship. Fellowship. However, when you consider this word fellowship, I want you to consider this word contextually because the word and the context matters. Because koinonia fellowship in this sense goes beyond simply associating with somebody. Oh, I passed by you through the grocery store. Hey, how you doing? This koinonia is dealing with participation fellowship, meaning there's this sense of active sharing in the work of the group as a whole. 
In other words, you are actively involved in some way, shape, or form and are not simply just associating by name only. It's like if you got a, the good old boys club. You pay to play, right? In the, other, in the sense, what I'm saying is, in order for you to play, you first had to get into the game. There's a sense of unity and camaraderie. So here's the question. What does Paul mean when he's speaking about the Philippians' participation in the gospel? Well, he's going to work that explanation out in verses 6 through 8. I want you to notice, Paul mentions their participation in the gospel from the first day until now. This means that their fellowship with Paul began when they were saved. When they came to faith in Christ Jesus, the gospel was preached and they moved from spiritual death to spiritual life. And perhaps what Paul has in view here is that he's thinking about these events initially with his interaction with these individuals when he first met them. Moreover, friends, it, it begs the question, when did the church of Philippi first begin? And at what moment did they begin? Well, we're going to find that out in Acts chapter 16. So flip with me really quickly to Acts 16. I want to prepare you there. Because it's going to be in Acts chapter 16 that we're going to find that the Lord has given Paul a vision. He's given Paul a vision to go to Macedonia where he is called along with his associates in order to preach the gospel. So what happens in Acts 16 is Paul, Timothy, and Luke are traveling to Macedonia to a particular region called Philippi. And if you remember from the first teaching that Steve did, Philippi was a Roman colony that was a leading district with great travel that occurred throughout that entire region. And it's specifically in Acts chapter 16, verse 13, that on the Sabbath day, Paul, Timothy, and Luke went outside the gate in Philippi to a riverside. And you might be asking, Wesley, why are you saying that Luke was a part of this journey that Paul was on? Well, I want you to notice the we that is used in the book of Acts. Who's writing Acts? It's Luke. So Luke is a part of this journey with them as they're going. So they've traveled outside of the city because the city, again, was not populated with enough Jews for that city to have a regular synagogue. Anytime Paul would ever go somewhere, he would always go to a synagogue to preach. However, because there was no synagogue there, he needed to know, well, where are the people who know about the Lord? Where are the people who know about Yahweh? And so Paul finds through word of mouth that there are individuals who know about the Lord at this particular riverside outside of the city gate. And this riverside was known as a place of prayer. Here's a picture of where they say Lydia and this group of individuals would meet in order to pray. And isn't it interesting that even within our context today, a building does not define the gathering of people. The building doesn't define the church. You are the church. I am the church. We see that in several places. I'll give you just two here. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, and 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, for your own time and leisure. So it's at this riverside, this place of prayer outside the gates, that Paul and his co-workers are preaching the gospel. They're preaching the gospel. And as they're at this place of prayer, they come across this woman named Lydia. And Lydia, after hearing the gospel preached, her heart is open. She responds to the gospel. And the text lets us know that her and her entire household are saved. They get baptized there at this particular river. And at that point, they then invite Paul and Timothy to all come to their house to spend some time into fellowship. Paul then is going to later preach the gospel to the Roman jailer after he has dismissed the spirit of divination that was in this little girl. And Paul just got annoyed with this girl, just following them around. He tells her, get out of here in the name of Jesus. And when the, this master finds out that he no longer has the money coming through this little girl anymore, he ends up going to the courts to get Paul arrested. This leads Paul to now meet the Roman jailer in the prison where Paul and Silas pray 
all of a sudden what happens? Their chains break, the do prison doors open, and they are released. So there, at that particular point, when the prisoner, the, the Roman guard rather, sees that the chains have broken, the prison doors are open, and he doesn't see the prisoners, he's about to fall on his sword. Why? Because if you lose your prisoner, you might, you might as well go to and die because it's a death sentence. You had a job, the job wasn't completed. So when he sees that Paul and Silas are still there, what ends up happening? The, the jailer goes to him and says, what must I do to be saved? So it's within Acts chapter 16, friends, that we find that the church of Philippi actually begins with Lydia and her household and the jailer and his household. This, that moment, those Several sequence of events are the moment by which the church began in Philippi. And this is where Paul's ministry and the Philippians' participation first began. Notice, notice here, however, that the text says, until now. That's huge. Don't miss that. This means that their participation began, what? With coming to faith. And that somehow their participation in Paul's ministry is continuing even after Paul left Philippi. So here's the question. What were they actually doing? What was the church in Philippi actually doing that Paul designates them as participants of the gospel? Well, we're going to see that in verse 7. However, before we, we get there, I want us to see what they were doing. We're going to observe here the confidence that Paul has, and he's exuding, in, in a sense, from seeing their lives in this particular participation in verse 6. So check out verse 6 with me. I'm going to read it into your hearing. It says, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. So Paul's confidence in these believers as participants in the gospel is rooted in the reality that the good work that began in the Philippians is going to continue until the day of Christ Jesus. I would underline or highlight these two words, good work and day of Christ Jesus. We're going to see those a bit later on. Because there, there's a few things that we need to address before we move too quickly. The first question that we have to ask is, who is the one that has begun this good work? Who's the one that began this good work? Hopefully the answer is clear for us that it is God. God has begun this good work, this salvific work within the lives of every believer and not just the Philippian church. It is God in Christ who has accomplished the work that he has brought peace. He has made peace between both God and man. That reconciliation has taken place. And knowing that the salvation is the means by which the Philippians are able to participate shows that the good work itself is salvation. That is the good work. So he who began salvation in you is how you can read it is going to perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Understand, friends, that fellowship with any group always requires that there be unity of mind and particular beliefs and shared behaviors. I'll put it to you this way. When is the last time that you fellowship with your enemy? When was the last time that you, you sat down across the table and fellowshiped with an enemy? Chances are you haven't. Why? Because fellowship, again, requires unity, a familiarity, common interest, and shared value. And friends, the same holds true with our salvation in Christ. What, what unifies us all, the reason that you and I can even commune today and worship together today without issue, without separation, is because Christ has done a rich thing in your life and in your heart. He saved you. He moved you from death to life. So Paul tells the Philippians that the same God that has saved you is the same God that is going to perfect you. That word perfect is worth noting. It is the Greek word epiteleo, which means to be brought to completion or to finish. 
to be brought to completion or to finish. And this word also happens to be in the future active indicative. Now you might be asking, Wes, what, do you, what, what is all of that? What, can you explain that? This simply means that this process of salvation that began in you, that began in the Philippian church, is consistently ongoing at work within you and is to be fully accomplished and complete. In other words, salvation is an actively ongoing work for the believer. Paul begins this by saying that it is God who has begun this work within the believer. Notice I, I said salvation is an ongoing work. So when you got saved, meaning when you placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that was one moment at one particular time. But salvation continues on at work within you. Why do I say that? Because Paul's going to say later on in this same book, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So what is Paul saying at that point? How do I work out what God has already worked? Well, we're, we're going to see that. I want to go to the next slide because salvation happens in what I consider three tenses. Three tenses. This is the, the first tense of salvation. What we see here is called justification. Justification. Simply put, because of the finished work of Christ, on the cross, when you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, it was Christ's righteousness that was placed upon your account. Therefore, you are saved from the penalty of sin. What does the scriptures tell us? The wages of sin is what? Death. The only way that you and I could be able to be saved and not have to deal with that particular penalty, not just of physical death, but of spiritual death, is that Christ had to do something in your heart. He had to come and accomplish something. So justification is a work that is done at a moment in time when a person places faith in Christ. The only thing, friends, that justifies is the perfect sacrifice of the perfect Savior. That's Jesus. And justification simply means that you are saved again from the penalty of sin. After one has been justified, you now move into what Paul expresses in our text that we saw as this ongoing perfecting work. What is that? That's the second tense of salvation. That is what is known as sanctification. Sanctification. That is simply a process that happens over time and is not a one and done moment. So justification was a one and done moment. You believed you were saved. Sanctification that requires work. That requires an ongoing thing. Sanctification, if I were to break it down, is an act which requires one to walk by faith through and by the power of the Spirit of God. So this tense of salvation deals with overcoming, check this out, the power of sin in your life. We We'll see Paul talk about this reality further in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 through 13. I'm going to read it into your hearing, but I mentioned it earlier before. This is what Paul's going to say. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence alone, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Lastly, notice in verse 6b, the duration of this perfection. The duration of this perfection. He says, until the day of Christ Jesus. In other words, there seems to be a finish line or a finishing event regarding the summation of this work within the believer's life. Notice, what the text does not say. It doesn't say until the day of the Lord. Please watch the phrase there. Rather, it says until the day of Christ Jesus. I want to go to our next slide here because I make a distinction here because these terms matter. If we end up flopping on the terms, it will mess up our theology. This is why when you see Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica, he has to remind them of what the coming of the Lord is dealing with. 
This specific event that Paul is speaking about is not to be confused with the day of the Lord. Why? Because the day of the Lord is dealing with what? The tribulation. It's dealing with the tribulation period. In other words, it's dealing with judgment. Paul uses this particular word, phrase, the day of Christ. In other words, Paul's joy is found in knowing that the work that the Lord began in them will be fully perfected and realized when the believers in Christ see Jesus. So that begs the question with Paul's use of this phrase, what is the day of Christ Jesus? Well, friends, what Paul is saying here is he's referring to the event of the rapture. Paul is speaking about the rapture as it pertains to the day of Christ Jesus. Although Paul did not have a set date in mind in which this event would happen, this event becomes the consuming joy that all believers joyously should anticipate and work towards. Friends, to see Jesus face to face in our new resurrected bodies at the rapture or when we die are in, in, in the presence of the Lord. Either way, it is a joy and reward to be with him, to be with him. So it's the rapture where every believer, again, will be glorified. And in knowing that that day is coming, Paul is telling them something right now in their present circumstance. He wants them to live well to the end, which brings us to the third tense of salvation. Glorification. Glorification. So as we examine Paul's statement in verse 6, Paul indicates that we have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. I'm going to say that again. We have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. And we'll examine again the tenses of salvation more and more as we walk throughout this book because Paul's going to lay it out for us plainly to see. But I don't want us to rush too quickly past this point. Why? Because remember, Paul said the Philippians were participating with him in the gospel. I want to bring that point back up again. We know that this participation began with Paul's ministry to these individuals in Philippi. Why? Because it is the Lord that sent Paul to Philippi to preach the gospel. But in verse 5b, Paul mentions that they have been participating with him in the ministry even until now. So another question comes about. It begs another question. This means that these believers were somehow actively engaged with Paul in gospel work. But how could they be actively involved with Paul in gospel work if they were not geographically located where Paul was physically regarding the work that Paul was doing? How are they actively at work? So we're going to arrive to that answer in verse 7 and 8. Check that out with me, Philippians 1, verses 7 and 8. We'll find our answer here. It says, for it is only right for me to feel this way about you because I have you in my heart. Since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, that word defense is apologia, you all are partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. So Paul continues here by mentioning that his feelings toward the Philippians were of great love in the sense that they were readily on his mind. And this is a good place to be, friends. That, that's because of their constant dedication to the Lord. Somehow these individuals in Philippi are constantly engaged in the gospel. And they're constantly engaged with Paul and his ministry regarding the gospel wherever he went. So it makes sense that Paul has this special bond with these individuals. It's like raising a child and seeing that child grow from infancy and into maturity. I mean, think of if you're a grandparent or a parent. It brings you great joy when you saw your son or daughter walk across that stage for graduation. The next big event was probably when they got married. The next one when they got their first job. And you're witnessing this constant growth in that individual time and time again. 
don't know if you've ever recorded uh, your child's first steps, that beginning moment. It brings joy to your heart. Why? Because you see them grow in leaps and bounds. And Paul, in the same way, is expressing this deep love and affection to this church regarding how they engage with him. Now, what should strike us is it's all the members in Philippi, again, that are participating but not are physically with him. Paul is using in this particular text, I want you to see in verse 7, he's using a particular word, and that word is partakers. Do you see that word, partakers? This is how they're engaging. That word partakers in Greek is going to be very similar to the word koinonia. However, it is not the same term. This word partakers is actually sin koinonos. Sin koinonos. And if you look at that word in the Greek, the prefix is sin, S Y N. That's where we get our word synchronize from or joint from. So what we find here is that Paul is dealing with this sense that they are sharing in his suffering or sharing in his imprisonment as he is both giving the gospel and defending the gospel. And Paul is letting them know, listen, you too are engaged with me as I go out and do ministry. Being that we've established the Philippians and that the fact that they were not physically there with them, it simply lets us know that the Philippians were co-laborers. They're co-laborers with Paul. And we find their means of participation in Philippians chapter 4, verses 14 through 17. Go there with, with me really quickly. Philippians chapter 4, verses 14 through 17. Because I want you to see the action that they're doing that allows them to be a partaker. Philippians chapter 4, verses 14 through 17. Check out what it says. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. For even in Thessalonica you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. There it is. There is our answer for how the church at Philippi were participants or partakers in the gospel. They were partakers of this grace with Paul through their financial giving. In other words, their gospel participation began with them sharing first in a common salvation to the point that it has now grown to their financial participation. In other words, where the Philippians' feet could not go, their finances made a way. And friends, herein lies a very biblical understanding of giving. That although I may not be able to go on that missions trip, although I might not be able or I don't have the preaching gift that this person has or this person has, I can still engage in gospel ministry with them through any means by which the Lord has equipped me to do so. And in this sense, the Philippians, through their finances, are engaging with the Apostle Paul in his ministry. Why do I say that? Because, friends, it's in their sacrificial giving that they were able to engage. Here when I say this, our bank accounts, our 401ks, amount to nothing if there is no kingdom contribution. I can stack up my little coins for my, my savings and my retirement when I get and hit that peak age, but was it worth it all if I didn't engage in kingdom work? Because ultimately, my treasures are being stored where? In heaven, not here. Because in this earth, in this world, it's going to burn up, it's going to fade, and nothing is going to matter. But what will matter are eternal dividends. 
will quickly figure out what's going on with the latest technology on Wall Street, but yet when it comes down to the it, it comes down to it at the end of the day, we end up being more focused on earthly things than eternal things. Paul's getting to the point here that we have to change our perspective. We have to put on a different set of lenses in order for us to see what it is that God is wanting to actively do. However, again, when we put our energy, when we put our treasure and our effort towards eternal things, the impact of gospel growth and evangelism to the lost is going to reap in huge rewards. As you'll see later on in this study, there is this sense that Philippi was Paul's primary means of financial aid. As a matter of fact, Philippi gave double what was necessary when he was doing mission work in Thessalonica. And herein lies how both Paul and the church at Philippi were co-laborers. That where I can't go, Paul, you can. What I can't do, Paul, you can. And it's interesting because even when Philippi could not give as much as they wanted to, given their constraints and their difficult circumstances, they gave what they could. It, it reminds me of, if you were with us in the Gospel of Mark, the lady who is at the, the temple treasury, and all she does is just gives one coin. And I can imagine the sound of that one coin dropping in that bucket, and everybody looking at her saying, that's all you got? But Jesus tells the disciples she gave her all. So it's not about the amount that you give. It's about your heart and seeing the impact that goes beyond your gift, the impact that goes beyond your giving. There are some people that can say, hey, I'm on a restricted income. I can't do this. I can't do that. You can pray. Because guess what? Your prayers can go where your feet can't. So Paul sees these men and women as his partners in ministry. He recognizes that the reason why he's able to do what he's able to do is because of the work that others have done to contribute to his ministry. And can I just say this really quickly? When Steve started this ministry over 20 years ago, the focus of this ministry charge no one. To this day, we don't charge anything. We give everything for free. The reason why, friends, we can do that is because of grateful participants like you who give. Whatever you give, however you give, that's what has allowed this ministry to grow and to do what it's doing for over 20 years. Most importantly, it is God's providential control and sovereignty at work through you that allows us to reach the millions of people that this ministry reaches. So we see in verses 7 through 8 that the deep compassion that Paul had for this church was rooted in two things, their common salvation and their gospel progression. From here, Paul moves to his expanded prayer for the saints. And that prayer is set in a place of deep love and affection for each individual in the church here at Philippi. Check out with me our last verses for tonight, verses 9 through 11, verses 9 through 11, it says this, And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and in all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I love that. As we, as we come to this close of Paul's opening statement, we see that the contents of his prayer encompasses his previous point regarding their walk and their work as participants. Their walk and their work as partakers. Remember, again, their walk in Christ began with them first receiving Christ as Savior for eternal salvation in verse 5. That started in Acts 16 when Paul comes to Philippi. And from the work that God began in their hearts, 
he would be faithful to continue that work until either their death or until they are raptured up. Remember, Paul looks at the rapture as this event can happen at any point, at any time. In other words, be ready, friends. It can happen at any moment. It's imminent. So in one aspect, what do we see? We see the sovereignty of God at work regarding salvation in the lives of his children. But as we'll see within the context of Paul's prayer, there's also a component of human responsibility. There's a component of human responsibility, and that is in conjunction or in participation with the Holy Spirit. If I were to put it differently, because God has done all the heavy work and having saved you and brought Christ into this world to die for your and my sins. It now allows us to be able to grow and have our life in Christ. Put it to you differently. The reason why you can do what God is calling you to do is because God has made it available for you through Christ. None of our accomplishments, none of our efforts in church missions and those things matter at all if you are not in Christ. This is why you can have an Ellen DeGeneres that gives millions upon millions of dollars to the orphanage. But yet there be no gospel impact. Gospel impact begins when you are in Christ. And everything from that moment is now going to your account. Does that make sense? What, what happens here? What is the Lord showing us? That if you want to see gospel growth in your life regarding the salvation that you have, you must put yourself under the weight of the word of God if you want to see the growth in Christ. That's the human responsibility component. And all of this is accomplished because of the resource that God has made available by means of his spirit indwelling you and I. The reason why the work of sanctification in the life of the believer happens is not because you're good and you dotted your I's and crossed your T's and read your memory verse of the day. No, it's because the Holy Spirit is actively at work in you, pushing you and moving you and convicting you of sin so that you may put aside those things and grow in the righteousness of God. Paul's prayer consisted of several things, and we find that in verse 9. He prays for three specific things. And I can actually break that down more and more, but I just want to break it down into three for tonight. He prays that the Philippians will increase in love, that's number one, increase in real knowledge, and increase in discernment. Love, real knowledge, discernment. The word love here in, in the Greek is agape, agape, which is dealing with sacrificial love with deep affection. In other words, it's, it's from the bowels, from, from the depths of the bowels of an individual. Paul's desire for this church was that their love towards one another would overflow in an exceeding way. It's that type of love that goes beyond the comforts of one's boundaries to care for their neighbor. I love you so much that whatever I need to do, I'm going to do it. Why? Because I love you. I'll move mountains if I can. This is the type of sacrificial love. Understand, Paul is not speaking about an emotional love here. Nothing emotional is happening. It's not based upon condition or circumstance. Rather, this love is shaped by Paul saying that this love is connected to the real knowledge and discernment that you have, that you are to grow in. I want us to examine these two words really quickly. The first word I want us to look at, those two words again, real knowledge and discernment. We'll look at the first one, real knowledge. That word in Greek is epinosis. Epinosis. The root word here is genosko, where we get our word knowledge from. However, this word, beginning with epi, it's different. Epinosis is knowledge that has been applied. 
knowledge that has been applied. In other words, this type of understanding has come by way of living out and doing what the word says. You will not experience epinosis if you just pick up your Bible, read the verse a day, walk away, and have not applied the word to your life. Furthermore, the word for discernment in Greek is athesis. athesis. This deals with one's decision making. Your decision making and your understanding based on the knowledge that is gained, check this out, by way of experience. By way of experience. In other words, as you grow in your love for the Lord and you pursue his ways, coming under the weight of the word of God, it gives clarity on how you should live. The, the, the best example I can give you, if you ever had an old radio station, FM and AM, and you got your, your particular station that you love, and you go to that particular station, but you come across some static, what do you have to end up doing when you come across that static? You have to adjust the dial. And as you adjust the dial, you either turn it to the right or turn it to the left. It's either going to get a bit more staticky or a bit less staticky. But the thing that helps you know that you found your station is you begin to pick up on the familiarity of the station that you listen to. You know about it. You listen to it time and time again. The only thing that's changing now is you're adjusting it. You're adjusting it. So what is happening here? The same way that you are adjusting, you have to tune out the exterior noise and focus on what's before you. What's before you? The goal, my station that I want to listen to. Friends, in the same way, we must tune out the noise of exterior circumstantial frequencies in an effort to hear and know God's word. If you get caught up in the things that are going on around you and that sways you more than what God's word says, then you're in the wrong frequency. It's like putting on a pair of, I was driving yesterday trying to go and get the kids. I left my sunglasses at home. And so I pick up my wife's sunglasses to try to put them on. Like, all right, this will be a bit of work. Well, my wife has prescription sunglasses. The moment I put those things on, I immediately took them off. Why? Because that prescription isn't set for my eyes. What is, what is Paul saying here? If you want to be able to have eyes for eternity, you have to have the right prescriptions. What prescriptions do you have on? Is it the lens of Christ? Is it the lens of the word of God? Or is it the lens of the world? Oh, this news broke out. Oh, man, what's going on? I got to check this. I got to check that. But what about trusting the Lord with all your heart and lean not in your own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path? You see, when you begin to have lenses of scripture, it begins to inform your way of life. And this only comes by what Paul says is real knowledge, the turning of the knob, and the discernment, knowing his word, which is foundationally rooted in love. The more you love God, the more you will get his, understand his word and grow in his word. If, if you didn't love God, would you open up the word? No. Your love determines the growth. The more that you love him getting into his word, the more you're going to see that growth. And as Paul mentions in his prayer, this love for one another, check this out, it matures us. Love matures. In other words, the more that our love for the Lord grows, the more that our affections and our attitudes toward the Lord and others grows. However, friends, the opposite stands true. The believer's lack of experiential knowledge of God reflects in how they deal with others and how they submit to God. Put it to you this way. The most miserable people in the world that you can ever come across are Christians who know about God yet fail to come under the weight of the word of God. Most miserable individuals in the world. You sit down and have a conversation with a miserable Christian, you will be drained by the end of that conversation. You're going to want to, where's your love? Where's your hope? 
Is it rooted in Christ or is it in a figment of your imagination of a Jesus that you concocted? Understand that growing in Christ is not an intellectual exercise or pursuit. Yes, a part of growing in Christ is knowing his word. Don't get me wrong. You need to know in order to grow. That's irrefutable. But applied knowledge is what develops and nurtures the intimacy in the Lord. I want to put a quote up really quickly from a New Testament Greek scholar regarding this word experiential knowledge. I know it's not as big there, but I'll read it to you until you're hearing. He says this, a Christian can have an understanding knowledge of the word. That is to be able to explain its meaning to others without having an experiential knowledge of the same. But when that Christian has put the word of God into practice in his or her life, then he has what Paul is talking about here. The difference between knowing your spouse and knowing your spouse is the level of intimacy that you have. You're either going to have a roommate or a partner. Because it's out of my love that I have for my wife that I'm able to grow in love with her all the more. Why? Because I spend time with her. And my intimacy with my wife grows all the more based upon that time. If I were to have a graph, the more time I spend, the more love grows. Many people think, oh, when I come to faith, oh, I love the Lord. And then what, gets, what ends up happening after that person comes to faith within that first year, if they're not in the word? It fizzles. Their walk with the Lord fizzles out. Because that love is not developed. It's not cultured. It's not brought into being. Friends, in the same way, our intimacy with the Lord produces growth in our walk and our work for Christ. And clearly, the church of Philippi was demonstrating that this is the fact that both their walk and their work was producing something. It was producing Paul's advancement for gospel work as well as their rewards coming soon. And this progression not only aided in Paul's efforts of reaching others, but it also goes to the account of the saints in Philippi. There's the good news. There's the spiritual rewards that we've heard about and have talked about. The question is, how do we know that according to this text? Well, because in verse 10, Paul tells us that it produces growth. It produces growth. Paul's prayer for them growing in real knowledge and discerning love in verse 9 is that it will enable the believer to rightly discern situations that will produce fruit. If I were to put it to you differently, regardless of the circumstances that come, a proper response in trial matters and it is rewarded accordingly based on one's life. Put it to you this way, your response to those around you will either promote gospel advancement or hinder your testimony as a witness. How will you respond? How do you respond? Plainly put, how you respond in every circumstance reflects your walk with the Lord and impacts the work that you do for the Lord. You ever met an individual that had come across a Christian circle, maybe not a believer, and the moment that they left that church or that Christian circle, they said, man, if, if that's what Christianity is about, I don't want to be a Christian. You ever came across an individual like that? Paul is saying how you use discernment in particular situations according to the intimacy that you have with the Lord will determine how others will come to know Christ. So what's in view here? What's in view here is a means of evaluating regarding our present response. That, that's your life and your work for your eternal rewards. Paul is saying you need to evaluate your life. 
You have the ability and the responsibility, according to what Paul's words are saying, by the illumination of the Spirit, you have a responsibility to discern, what should I say in this situation? How should I respond in this situation? I'll give you a perfect example. Yesterday, our, our godson, my, my, my best friend, his dad, was rushed to the ER. And I was in the middle of trying to prepare for next week and, and things of this nature. And I get the call, and they said, hey, could you come and pick up baby boy? Now, in my flesh, as I'm working and preparing, this is a huge inconvenience. I got these things planned. But then when I began to think about the discernment of the word of God and exercising wisdom, what began to come up in my spirit was, it doesn't take too much time for you to do something and demonstrate love to someone that's in need. You're going to have to sacrifice some time, Wes, but I'll make it up in the end. When you evaluate those things, evaluation can only come by means of discerning. If you're not discerning the word of God, you're not going to make good decisions. This is why it's so important for new Christians in the faith to be rooted in a solid Bible teaching church because they need to know the word of God so that they can grow in the grace of God. So remember the goal that Paul is using here was that term, the day of Christ, the rapture. What is he saying? At the end of the day, every believer is gonna stand at the bema seat of Christ. Every believer is going to be evaluated for how they live and what they did for Christ. Wes, where do I see that? Romans 14, verse 10 and 12. You will be evaluated. You will stand before Jesus Christ, and he is going to look at all of your works, everything that you did, and it's going to be burned. And whatever is left is what you're going to walk in with. The question on the table is what's going to be left? Or will there be anything at all? I got into heaven, but I walked in with nothing. Paul's point in mentioning these things that are excellent, sincere, and blameless, he's speaking to what that intimacy should produce, how we should be living how we should be walking, how we should be working. However, friends, if we're not obeying the word of God, if we're not coming under the weight of the word of God, we leave ourselves prone to a life lacking spiritual growth. I want to leave you with these few words here. The word approve in verse 10. Look at that word approve. That word is an interesting word. It is the Greek word dakimaso, dakimaso, which means to examine or to approve. And this word, when it's used, it's regarding the testing of metals and or coins to determine if they meet the quality standard. Does it meet the quality standard? In other words, you and I are to examine our motives, what we do, how we live. This is why Paul says and uses the phrase the day of Christ, because upon the event, you and I are going to be evaluated. Therefore, our motives, our ambitions, our perspectives should be eternally minded and not earthly focused. Friends, when we have a clear view and a clear understanding of the importance of the rapture, I truly believe that it will shift how we live. It's going to shift how you live. That if you learn to have eyes for eternity, you will start seeing that how you live, how you work, how you love, how you lead, it'll all change. Furthermore, this reality shows us that there is, again, personal responsibility on the believer's account and sanctification. God's already done the heavy lifting. He's already done the hard work. He is requiring you to participate. The best analogy that I can give is if you're sitting on the bench and coach says, all right, you're in the game, get off the bench. What are you going to do? Do you know your position, where you're going to be? 
See, friends, this requires you and I to depend upon the Lord for the growth that we need. And here's the reality. Not everybody is going to be called into full-time vocational ministry. It's not for everybody. But guess what? Your life is a full-time ministry to those who are around you. How you operate on the job is a ministry. How, husbands, you love your wives is a ministry. Wives, how you submit and love your husbands is a ministry. How you're on the job, it's a ministry. If we start looking at our lives as a ministry and as an example of how can we further expel, progress rather the gospel of Jesus Christ, then we begin to change how we look at the job rather than waking up and saying, oh, got to get up and go to work today. You are now get up a bit more chippery and excited about going to work. Why? Because there's gospel opportunity. Gospel opportunity is what Paul is getting at. Being a better father, being a better mother, being a better employee, being a better community leader, being a better boss is all ministry. The question is, what lens are you seeing what you're doing through? Are you going to see it as an opportunity to progress the gospel or are you going to make it a hindrance? James chapter 1 verse 5 puts it this way regarding the use of our spiritual resources. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Finally, I'm going to end here with verse 10, running low on time. Paul states in verse 10 that this can be done when we have been filled with the fruit of righteousness. Notice that it does not say the fruits, plural, of righteousness. It's singular because the various results of righteousness produced within us comes from a single source, one seed, one seed. As you submit to the Spirit, you're going to see things grow. What are those things that are going to grow? Well, Galatians 5, through 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So as you get under the weight of the word, you're going to see in your life more patience produced. Uh, my wife and I are kid all the time with this. When I'm, when I'm asking the Lord, Lord, help me with my patience, she said, be careful what you pray for. Because what that allows is the Lord to bring about opportunity for you to exercise patience. Patience isn't just going to happen by osmosis. Lord, give me patience. Okay, boop. No, he is going to bring about certain events, certain situations, certain circumstances in your life that are going to pressure you. And that pressure is to approve you. And that approving is going to say, all right, what's the quality that comes out? It's not what I want. Okay, let's pressure again, pressure again, pressure again. Is it approved? Yeah, this is good. It's maturity, friends. Paul is going to walk us through in this book, and he's going to show us how to mature, how to be sanctified, how we are to live to the glory of God, that whatever circumstances come, whatever we go through, that we are able to stand firmly in it and to overcome in it, not because we know all things and have a lot of knowledge and know the Greek and the Hebrew. No, all of that doesn't matter if there is no love for this word. That the more that I grow in this, the more that I am able, as Paul says toward the end there at that verse, he says, because this is going to produce glory and praise to God. That when we stand before the Lord at the Bema seat, that we want to, the Lord to do what he did for Stephen when Stephen was stoned. He stood up and applauded Stephen when he was martyred and killed. Why? Not because of the circumstance, but because Stephen said, whatever I need to do, the gospel is going to go forth. Friends, my question for you is, what are you going to do? Are you going to get into the game? Or are you going to sit on the sideline on your blessed assurance? The choice is yours. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your kindness. But we thank you for your truth. I pray that by the power of your spirit, you will lead us and guide us into greater maturity. That you will allow us to live a life that is pleasing, holy, and acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We thank you for this time. We ask that you bless it. We ask that this word fell on fertile ground. 
It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.